Welcome back to the Flex the Diet podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. On this podcast, we talk about all things to increase muscle performance and improve body composition, all in a flexible approach without destroying your health. And today we've got a little bit of an off topic, but I find this area of research to be super fascinating. And I'll tentatively be giving a talk on this topic at the International Society of Sports Nutrition in Florida coming up mid-June of this year, 2023. And we're talking about the use of psychedelics. And in this case, a little bit more on the compounds DMT that is found in the plant medicine ayahuasca. And before we get into that, I wanted to let you know that the Viz Flex Cert will open up again on March 20th of this year. If you're looking for ways to increase true longevity, all while being more resilient, anti-fragile, or do advanced recovery work, such as maybe you're doing some crazy breath work, like holotropic breathing, which definitely can be a psychedelic experience in and of itself, or you're just doing non-psychedelic work, simple recovery breathing, better breathing mechanics, why you should do real high-intensity interval training, zone 2 cardio, cold water, sauna, pH changes, all that stuff is actually in the physiologic flexibility certification. You might be wondering, how the heck are all those things? Well, it turns out all those things can alter what are called the homeostatic regulators. So the four main ones in the body are temperature, pH, fuel systems, and then breathing, which is oxygen and carbon dioxide. And it's my biased belief that if you target those systems in a specific way, that you will get increased performance also, and that'll translate into better longevity and just being generally much harder to kill. So this is the level two to the Flex Diet certification. We're taking the ideas instead of being metabolically flexible, which is a good idea, but we're expanding that concept of flexibility out to you as an entire human organism. So if you need more information on that, check out the PhysFlex information at physiologicflexibility.com. You can get on the wait list there to get all the information. I'll have some fast action bonus items also. So go to physiologicflexibility.com. And as mentioned today, this one is a little bit off topic, although you can find some links to information that I've discussed about this before. And of course, the standard caveat is none of this is medical advice. Please seek out information from your physician. By all means, please do your research, do your homework. None of this is to be taken lightly. And as of this recording, uh, the compounds we are going to discuss, at least in the U.S., are scheduled illegal drugs. So take that into consideration. Uh, today we're talking with Rebecca. You can find information on her. Most likely is going to be on Twitter. It's at B-E-K plants. That is a B-E-K-P-L-A-N-T-S. And she has a wealth of knowledge in this area. She is currently a PhD in cultural anthropology, looking at fieldwork in the Peruvian jungle. When we talked to her, that's exactly where she was. Just to this, we talk about this in the podcast also. She was looking at different states of altered consciousness for her master's work. And she actually has a background in fitness and has done some stuff in that area. So really super knowledgeable in both from the academic side and also the experiential side, which I find is a really a fascinating blend. So in this podcast, we talk about the use of psychedelics for various different things. And in this one in particular, we talk a little bit more about DMT and a plant called ayahuasca. So ayahuasca itself isn't necessarily a single plant, as you'll learn. It's a combination of different plants and even different what they call admixtures that can be added to it. So if you're interested in these compounds or what they may be beneficial for, potential pros and definitely potential cons, 
I think you'll really enjoy this podcast. And huge thanks to Rebecca for her time. I really enjoyed this conversation. And if you want to learn more from her, I would highly check out her Twitter. You can go on there and find a list to a lot of the other things that she has written. And I think you will enjoy it. So here is this podcast with Rebecca. Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. And Rebecca, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks Mike, for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. And as I I called that you were in Costa Rica, but you're actually down in Peru instead. And it's quite warm and possibly rainy there, you said. Yeah, we're just in the rainy season now. So we're lucky to catch a break with the rain, but it's good for the plants and everything. Everything's growing well. Um, but yeah, as for other things, it's a bit difficult to do stuff these days. <laughs> and I would imagine Peru is similar to Costa Rica where the rainy season, when it rains, it I've never seen so much rain in my life. I was in Costa Rica when it was <laughs> the rainy season and I thought they were kidding. And I think they got at sometimes a couple inches per hour or something insane. It was pretty crazy to see. Yeah, I've definitely been in some where I'm staying right now. The rainy season's not too bad, but in deeper parts of the jungle, oh my gosh, it feels like the world's ending is all I can say. Like it, it really feels like the world's going to end. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the storms are pretty big. Yeah, I found it was fun to watch if I was inside in a nice safe place and I didn't have to go anywhere. We got caught one yeah. time not too far away from where we were staying and we were trying to get up this path in the jungle that hadn't had any like tiles or anything on it yet. And the rain okay. turned the path like this clay type dirt that's super slippery. Yeah, we had a crab walk our way out of the jungle. <laughs> oh no, uh, it sounds like an experience though. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely one to remember for sure. And what are you doing down in Peru for the people listening in? Yeah, so I'm here for one year as part of my doctoral research. I'm a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology. So I'm here for one year investigating the world of medicinal plants, specifically altered states of consciousness. And what I mean by altered states of consciousness is predominantly psychedelics, but also different consciousnesses that are, that are separate from the everyday. And that's quite common in the medical, the traditional medical system here. So I'm here for a year investigating their practices and what the function of these altered states of consciousness are in improving Amazonian communities. Very cool. Is the goal at the end to have it be more of a qualitative type study? Or are you just writing up your experience and what you found? Or is there a quantitative portion to it or a mix of both? Yeah, so predominantly qualitative. I'm doing it the cultural anthropology way, so I'm doing participant observation, which means participating in day-to-day -day life as well as medicinal plant ceremonies. I take notes on my own experiences, but I also do interviews. So with other participants, maestros, which are the practitioners, and also apprentices, just to get an idea of what's going on and a bigger picture thing. And after that, I'll do my analysis when I get back to New Zealand. But yeah, for the study, it's predominantly qualitative. My master's I did in psychology, and I also looked at psychedelics, and I looked at experiences of ego dissolution across classical psychedelics. And for that one, that was a mainly quantitative study. So it's nice to have two different variations and ways of looking at psychedelics and psychedelic research. Very cool. And what did you find in your master's research? It was a great project, actually. <laughs> I looked at experiences of ego dissolution. And to do that, I looked at, firstly, when you look at the current literature on ego dissolution or ego death, it doesn't really specify what parts of the ego is dying or being dissolved. So what I did was I did some research firstly into the different parts of the self in psychological research. And then I developed, I put together a questionnaire relating to the different parts of the self and asked people to fill this out based on their most profound psychedelic experiences. So talking about like the different parts of the self is in the part of the self that is the self-identity, like who you identify with, who your story, your narrative, you tell yourself. And then there's also the part of the self that's a very physical embodied experience. And so I looked at ayahuasca, DMT, LSD, and psilocybin magic mushrooms. And just this, I'll do a two sentence summary of my findings. Yeah. So basically what I found was experiences with ayahuasca and DMT, very strong ego dissolution that was generally pretty high. And they were quite similar in the parts of the self that they dissolved. Hmm. And with 
LSD and magic mushrooms, the the extent of which the ego was dissolved overall was a bit lower, but very similar once again. And the parts of the self that they dissolved also very similar. So that was quite an that was quite an interesting finding for me. And also what was interesting is I asked people to tell me about their most profound experience. And I also asked them to tell me about their dosage, just to get an indication of what effect the dosage has on people's experience. And I actually didn't find a significant result with dosage having an effect on people's perceptions of an experience that classified as perhaps profound or one of ego dissolution, which was quite interesting and something that I'd say would need a little bit more research on because that's quite contradictory to a lot of psychedelic findings these days. Do you think part of the dosage is different people maybe have different Different sensitivities to different drugs? Like we know caffeine has different metabolism. We know all sorts of drugs, like the metabolism isn't exactly linear between a group of people. So I would assume the active compounds and psychedelics may follow that also. It would be, and that would be a great follow-up study. That would be, I suppose, the next step in this would be to look at that. Yeah, look at how people are interacting with it, with other lifestyle things and their general metabolism. And, and yeah, but that was quite an interesting finding. I had about 600 participants, so oh, wow. quite a few. That's uh, a yeah, lot. I had more than I expected. But, but, but that was nice for a quantitative study because that means I can actually I can look at the data and I'm like, okay, this, these numbers are telling me what 600 people are trying to tell me. Sure. Yeah. Then how would you describe the difference for people who don't have any experience between, say, in your study, for example, LSD, ayahuasca? They're both psychedelic compounds. If you look at the research and you know what people have reported, they seem to report similar but yet different effects. 100%. Yeah. Similar but different is, yeah. And I suppose I've spent a bit of time in the psychedelic field. So for me, they're quite different, actually. And I'd say the main difference is perhaps even the set and setting. So for, I suppose, for the listeners who haven't come across that in the psychedelic literature, the set and setting is pretty much the set within yourself and how you feel when you go into an experience, your life, if you have, I don't know, problems with your relationship or you're going through a major life change, like moving cities or things like that. And then the setting is the environment. Um, So with ayahuasca in general, and this is uh, out out of all of the psychedelics, I would say that ayahuasca is probably the one that captures my interest the most. And that's because of the setting. So it's generally used very ceremoniously and you would have a guide. So a maestro is what they call them in Peru, who would lead the ceremony. And you have certain chants and everything that they will sing. And there's a distinct opening of the space there's a distinct closing of the space it's almost a container in which the experience is held whereas the way that LSD has developed it hasn't been developed in a ceremonial context often you you come across a lot of LSD at say festivals or parties but now you're also seeing it in psychedelic therapy which is perhaps a little bit more ritualistic so I'd say that's maybe the main difference and as part of my master's research as well and I actually haven't gotten around to analyzing this half of the data I had sufficient data to submit my thesis but so I have this as well. I did 30 in-depth interviews, so one hour to one and a half hours with people's most profound experiences. And a theme that kept coming up is that people were able to let go when they felt safe in their environment. So they were able to let go of their body, like they were able to have that part of the ego dissolve. So like the body sensations being like my body's feeling a bit funny now, but that's okay. Like I feel safe. I can let go of this. I'm not being anxious about my body being out of sorts. I can just relax and let the experience happen. And they told me they felt safe when their physical environment was good. And so for me, I wonder, okay, so does the ayahuasca ceremonial context, having a professional guide the space who's very experienced, does that help the people maybe relax their bodies? Does that help them have a profound experience? Does that help them maybe travel a bit further than say an experience that doesn't have that? Yeah, yeah. And it's, I've only done ayahuasca a couple of times and it was in Costa Rica, it was Mm. in a very... I would say traditional setting, it depending on where you do it and who does it, it's always a little bit different. I don't have any experience with other places, but it was very interesting to me about how much time they put into the set and setting. And we did it with the same mm-hmm. person, two different locations. And the first time it was in a room overlooking the jungle, there was this kind of infinity pool into the backside of it, which was all open. This complete jungle was all up on a cliff. And I remember that the guide, she put this guy named Rob just kneeling at the this entrance. And she's like, okay, your job is to guard the entrance. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, what? This makes no sense. Who's going to crawl through the jungle 
up over this infinity pool to come into our space. This makes no sense. And then after mm -hmm. about a couple hours and four glasses later, I remember lying there going, <laughs> I'm so glad that Rob guy is there. He's doing a great job. This is awesome. Oh, all of a sudden, knowing that he was there, I had no idea what he was doing. I just felt mm. like he should be there. And I felt safer for having him there, which was very odd to say the least. So, yeah. Yeah. Also, I'd almost, when you were talking about that, I always wanted to add one other thing on. It almost, I feel like the ceremony almost starts even when they start cooking the brew, because that's when they start, because they're cooking the brew in itself is quite a ritualistic experience yes of protection and making sure that the visions are good and how they collect the vine so it's got a lot of it's got a lot of intention it's got a lot of thought behind it i would say like it's quite a particular practice yeah but your story of rob's quite funny i have to say i'm glad that it felt good for you in the end <laughs> yeah it was one of those things where i chose to do with a group of friends who we had known it was very small ceremony and even after we got we went on the trip specifically and got there. My wife came with me and we both did it along with six other people the first time. And I remember telling mm -hmm. her, I'm like, we went over a day beforehand. We did combo the day before, met the shaman who's going to do the ceremony that night. And I remember mm -hmm. telling her, I'm like, okay, so if I meet this person and I still don't have a good vibe, I'm like, here's all my money. Like I'm out. So like, yeah. Even up to the point of going through with it, I still was like, ah, I don't know. And then you meet the person and you're like, oh, yeah, it just seems like everything's going on. You just, it's a weird thing where you just trust your gut feeling at that point, which is, as someone who's very more on the science side, that's, is it intuition? Is it your subconscious? Mm -hmm. Knows what's actually going on at that point. But it was just, because it's so foreign, you don't have a lot of, at least I didn't, a lot of reference going into it you're mm -hmm. just kind of trusting that person that everything goes well per se you're putting a lot of confidence in them and yeah i think that's why it's important to really know who you're drinking with and get if you get that good feeling then yeah i've had that feeling too and it, it's funny you can't quite put a finger on it but i'd say it's your intuition you can just feel when something's right and when something's a little bit off do you think that's intuitive thing where at some level we understand that set and setting are important and that your mm. brain is just kind of scanning to make sure that portion is okay? I'd almost want to say if we want to get scientific about it, I wonder how, if our brain's just working in very minute, specific ways. So if it's just picking up little things, say, in the environment that aren't quite, aren't quite right, like technical details. But yeah, if we want to get scientific, that's how I sometimes like to hypothesize that intuition. If it's just my brain picking up on little minute details in my environment, that's okay, that's not really... That doesn't really fit with what I believe to be correct or what I believe to be best for me. So, yeah, I have no specific answer on what intuition is. For me, it's a feeling and yeah, yeah. And it's really important to make sure you drink with someone that's good and safe. I've spent about eight years, over the last eight years, doing work in the Amazon. So I've come across a fair few people who practice and you come across some characters and then you come across some absolutely amazing, amazing practitioners. How would you have, if someone is interested, especially if they're traveling to a foreign country, any mm. thoughts about best practices of how do you find someone that is good? Because it is a very foreign thing. I got lucky that yeah. the people we went with, I knew them and they had gone there the year before and I just trusted them. I knew that they were very particular about what they were doing. Mm. Both times, everything mm. worked out fine, but I heard some horror stories of people just going off a of price and, oh, this looks like a nice pamphlet and traveling to Peru yeah. or Costa Rica or wherever. And it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard these stories too. And there's a few parts to that as well. Firstly, for the individual themselves, I think it's important to do your own research on what ayahuasca is. If you're on medications, what medications to be aware of before drinking ayahuasca. So SSRIs are generally not a good idea. They don't really work well with it ayahuasca but of course you have to consult your doctor and make sure it's okay to go off them so making sure like physically your body's okay to receive ayahuasca that's that to me is the first step okay. am i putting anything in my body that won't react well just on a chemical level and secondly i have a blog so i've been writing about my experiences in the amazon and soon i'll do a post just about a few places of recommendation that i've come across just because i have people asking me like okay i want to go to sure. Peru. where can i drink again i've Drunk, at this stage, I've drunk with about 15-ish, 15 to 20 different people. Yeah, and out of that, I have three that I recommend. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
That yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not rec- the reason I'm not recommending the others, some of them I would say are unsafe, but then some of them I would say just it's the difference between going to a, an average doctor and a specialist. So if you really want a good job done, you go to the best specialist you can find. So that would be my recommendation, someone who does their job really well. And there are some people here who are absolutely phenomenal at what they do. And also for people who perhaps, I don't know, if you don't end up reading the recommendations, it's good to talk to people who have experience in the field or I don't know, who you can get a personal recommendation from, I'd say is the best way to go. So just start asking around and say, oh, okay, I'm interested in this. Do you know anyone? Or do you know anyone who might know anyone? I find to be the best way. The way that I met the current maestro that I'm working with, I've been working with him for eight years. And it was because I was living in the city, in the jungle for about nine months. And originally the first the first month or so, a lot of people were like, hey, I know this guy, he does ceremonies. I was like, oh, it doesn't feel right. And it was quite touristic almost. Mm. And after about four months, I went to a local fair in a nearby village. I met a guy from Ecuador, and he was like, oh, there's a guy, he lives out in Lamas, which is a small town. He was like, he does some ceremonies. If you're interested, just come and you can try him out, see how you feel. And I was like, okay, sure. And he's very local. He works mainly with locals. And I got a great feeling about him. And But that took me some time. Like, I had to stay in this place for a while. I had to let all the touristic people go. And then after a while, I was like, okay, I'm learning who the locals are drinking with. Yeah, so that was my process. And that's how I met the other maestro who I'll be working with in August as well. It was just got to know the local people. And then it was through word of mouth in that way. Oh, okay, this guy's pretty good. And yeah, you might want to go check this out. Yeah. No, that's great. And do you recommend, especially for people who are newer, usually smaller ceremonies as opposed to large i've heard yeah people have good experience with both small and large but just again based on my very limited experience i remember the first year like halfway through the ceremony thinking oh i'm so glad i love all the people i'm here with and that there's no Mm. dickheads this is so nice (laughs) i like at that point i had this vision of being with 40 or 50 other people and just Mm -hmm. having this weird visceral response of and then being so grateful that I was in the space that I was in and again this is just my biased point of view I completely feel you with that for me my preference and actually this would be a recommendation and quite a strong recommendation I would say is probably 15 is probably the maximum you want to be drinking 15 Mm. to 20 is the absolute maximum. So the ceremonies I usually participate in here are around 12 people. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for the maestro to navigate. If you're navigating 50 people's experiences, my God, that's a lot of work. Save that's a good maestro, somewhere around 20 is probably their limit um, to do a really good job. And you've also got to think, like with the maestro here, I was talking with him recently. I was like, okay, tell me about your ceremony. What's the maximum you'd have? He was like, oh, maybe 15. But he was like, with newcomers in the space, I probably have a maximum of maybe 10 newcomers in the space at any given time. Because for the newcomers, it's a lot more work. Like they, they're they new to the space. There's a lot more work that the maestro has to do just to clean their bodies, check their bodies, make sure they're okay. Yeah, so I'd say if it's a tourist retreat and they're doing 50 ceremonies and everyone's new, uh, 50 people per ceremony and everyone's new, really question the level of care that you're perhaps getting. Yeah, I question the level of care and how much yeah. healing you would actually be able to get from that space. And in the ceremonies you're doing, do they typically have assistants or people that help with it? Or is there just a main teacher there or does it vary? Yeah, so as part of my field work for it, now I'm staying with the maestro in Lamas and I'll be here for a few months and then I'll go to Pucalpa and work with another maestro. So with the maestro here in Lamas, he has one assistant that helps out before he used to work alone. So it was just him. And he's very capable. He's got 40 years of experience. He's very capable even to work by himself. But, uh, but his assistant is also learning. So it's like an apprenticeship for his assistant as well to help out and to gain some experience. And with the other maestro that I'll be working with in Pukalpa, he as well, he's very good at what he does and he can have the ceremonies alone, but he might have two or three students that are sitting in the space and they might help with the chanting and It's their way of practicing, but also his way of having a little bit of extra help because it is also a lot of work. I'm sure you would have experienced that in your ceremonies. I sit there sometimes going, you're really doing a great job. This is very heavy work that you're doing and you're doing it very well. So I think it's also nice for them to have a bit of extra help. Yeah, I think my estimation going in was like, oh yeah, you have the ceremony, each person drinks however much amount and 
he just lay down and whatever mm-hmm. happens and the shaman goes to sleep halfway through the ceremony or whatever. And it was like, not like that at all. The first ceremony that I did, all the stuff I had was, it was really late and delayed for some reason. Okay. And I got, which was in some way a blessing because I got to see everybody go through everything mm-hmm. just basically being stone cold sober the most of the night. And I remember we went up one by one. And so you got your first dose. And I remember just kneeling there and the shamans doing some chanting and there's music. And I could see the reaction of people going around based on the first person who got served. And then she starts having a reaction. And then the person next to her does. And then the Mm. person next to her does 10 minutes later. (laughs) And I'm just sitting there like going, oh man, here comes a wave. Oh crap. Oh crap. And then nothing happened. So oh, that's weird. And so she comes around again. She said, do you want another dose? I'm like, sure, whatever. And it was interesting to see the person across from me. I think she had two cups and she had a crazy experience where if you've ever heard the sound of someone choking on their own vomit, it's a very visceral reaction. And so that's what started happening to her and everyone went over there and helped her and everything turned out to be good. But that was the start of the ceremony and the shaman's holding her going, come back to your body, come back to your body. And I'm watching this going, oh my God, what did I sign up for? What am I doing? (laughs) And then to see the guy next to me was just lying down, like taking a nap. I'm like, that's Mm. weird. And so she comes by to him and she's, are you doing okay? And he's like, "Ah." And she's, do you want any more? And he's oh, (laughs) I'm like, oh, he's going through some shit too, but he looks completely different than the other person. (laughs) (laughs) So it was just fascinating to see just the whole myriad of different responses all happening at different times. Some of them happening at the same time. And that ceremony was interesting also because... I think she had seven assistants there. And I think there was only like eight of us. And I remember her saying beforehand that she felt like she needed extra people to support us. A lot of them were people assisting and apprenticing and that kind of stuff. And then the second ceremony we did was a year later and it was like super quiet. Like no one made a peep the whole night. It was just the two people. And she's, yeah, I think this one will be a little bit more relaxed. (laughs) It was. I don't know if it was just fascinating to see both ends of the spectrum from in theory the same shaman it's the same the same place where they get the ayahuasca from which i know we'll talk about can be also variable in and of itself but Mm. i was just kind of shocked by the profound difference in things that were the same but yet very different experienced yeah it's fascinating (laughs) do you feel that there's a lot of my hypothesis which i have nothing to base this on is you could be in a very similar set and setting, similar teacher, shaman, whatever word you want to use to associate with a guide and have a similar ayahuasca, at least the preparation, the location of where it comes from. I have this feeling that you could have a very radically different experience also at the same time. It just, to me, it feels like there's an inherent kind of variability in it that's hard to pin down yeah i would i would somewhat agree yeah the experience changes and i perhaps it's the environment at the time it's what's happening yeah i've but also on i don't know that's a, that's a tricky question yeah. but yeah i just say the experience changes and it's almost like the plant shows you what it needs to show you at that time and that might change ceremony to ceremony i've had a few ceremonies where we've drunk a few days in a row the most i've done is four days in a row but we recently did three days in a row which was quite interesting Hmm. to also see the build up because we were keeping our diet really clean did one ceremony then the next night we drank again and the next night we drank again same brew same people same location and each experience folded on the next one Hmm. Uh, correct me if i'm wrong but what is the half-life of the dmt by the second night i would assume that most of it would be excreted by your body or is there some gradual buildup if you're doing it kind of like three nights in a row? Yeah, so that's an interesting question, which I actually started looking into recently was the half-life of ayahuasca. It's, it's, quite, it's quite small. It's only a few hours, but I'm a bit 
bit I'm a bit skeptical about the current research on it. I feel like there needs to be a bit more and I feel like that the current research is perhaps more DMT only focused, whereas you've got to remember mm. the brew has a lot of other compounds in it and often you'll have other, other plants as part of the brew. There's also the concept of a dieta, which is a diet you do. So that starts pretty much after the first ceremony and you'll keep a clean diet. You won't have salt, you won't have sugar. There might be some other food restrictions. The reason you don't have salt is because that cuts DMT in your body. Interesting. So, so it cuts it, the half-life or it causes you to break it down sooner? I think it causes you to break it down sooner. Yeah, so for instance, you might do a diet of 10 days and with the 10 days, you're keeping no salt in your body, but you're doing ceremonies this whole time. So it gets stronger and stronger as you continue the diet. Or you might do one month or you might do three months or six months, depending on if you're apprenticing or not. Yeah, and in my personal experience, this is what I've been looking into recently with my research is the different dietas and how it works with the ayahuasca because that's quite an important concept here. And the reason they do the dietas is to keep the plant in the body. So to really get to know the plant, to really be able to feel it. And in my experiences with this, it's definitely the not having the salt and sugar, especially the salt, it, it makes the following ceremony much stronger and the one after that exponentially stronger interesting mm. so maybe it is prolonging the half-life thing because like you said the only studies i've seen looked at the half-life of just dmt it, i haven't seen any maybe there are studies that have looked at half-life of the other ones which you could theorize if those are staying elevated longer and you're supplying more dmt maybe your activation of it is going to be potentially quite different too Exactly. And I think this is just an area where we need to have a little bit more, a little bit more research as we develop into this field. Just a few more studies need to be done on this. And for people listening who may not be familiar with ayahuasca, can you give a basic breakdown of what exactly is ayahuasca in terms of components? And then maybe what are some common like admixtures that they may add to the yeah. quote unquote traditional ayahuasca in my little air quotes here yeah so pretty much ayahuasca is a brew it's a tea as you might it's definitely tea is probably um, not the best way to describe it i wouldn't describe it as tea but yeah. yes <laughs> <laughs> It's a beverage you can see. Beverage, in a there we go form. yeah 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 <laughs> so it consists of the vine the ayahuasca vine and it consists of chacruna leaves. And I'm talking about the brew specifically in Peru. In some parts of the jungle, you don't come across chacruna, so they might use another plant. So the mm. ayahuasca vine has what's called an MAOI inhibitor. And the chacruna leaves have high quantities of DMT. So with DMT, if you just drink DMT, you won't have the effect. And that's because our bodies process DMT super, super quickly. You can smoke DMT. That's quite a common way of ingesting it or you can also take it intravenously but if you're taking it in liquid form your body will process it too quick so that's where the inhibitor comes into play with the ayahuasca vine and it's fascinating because you need to have these in specific quantities for this to be a brew that actually causes an effect in your body with the ayahuasca vine itself there with the maestro i'm with now he says there are nine different types of the vine so that's also another factor to take into consideration and i've asked most maestros this as well just because everyone has a different everyone has something new to add but what i've come across is perhaps there are three or four that are used commonly and the most common one is called cielo ayahuasca which is sky ayahuasca and that's identifiable by a yellowish tint and as for other admixtures, chacruda and ayahuasca, that's the base level ayahuasca. There are some people who don't add anything else to that, and that's all they want to drink with, and that's that's their brew. There are other people who might add, let's say, what did we put in the most recent brew? We put the leaves of toe, which is in English, it's datura, so the flower, but we put the leaves of that in the brew, and that's meant to help with the visions. Some people say that's used for black magic or stuff like that, but I think it depends how you use it. With the leaves of the flower, it's just for extra visions. I have a plant here that I like to put in the brew. It's called One Visa Bihau. It's a little, it's a little shrub. Again, you put in five leaves of that into the brew, and that also helps with visions. And perhaps having slightly softer effects, slightly more, slightly more, how would I put it, heartfelt experiences. Mm. Um, less ass kicking <laughs> yeah less ass kicking a little bit softer you've got a range of different admixtures that you can put in the brew but like i said some people prefer to keep it really simple and just have the ayahuasca and chapruda and i've had these brews and they're still absolutely phenomenal it's also a good idea to ask the maestro that you're drinking with what sort of ayahuasca they're using what they're putting in the brew just so you know and so you have a point of reference there's also there was also a really interesting study done I think it was in 2021 
and it was by Hal Halle Kasich and she's based in Estonia and her colleagues and they analyzed 100 plus ayahuasca brews from Europe and Brazil and they did a chemical composition analysis to work out what's actually in the brews and pretty much in some of the European brews they found a lot of things that aren't meant to be in an ayahuasca brew and I'm not talking about admixtures I'm talking about things like psilocybin things that are Mm. essentially just try to give people an effect that they haven't really signed up for you're here to drink ayahuasca you're not here to take mushrooms so it's quite important to know where your brew is coming from and what you're actually putting into your body i would say yeah that's one thing i found is that it's so variable the mm -hmm. shaman we went to uses primarily which is from the church of daime and my understanding is historically they just kind of use the shrub and the vine and they have their own seven day process of making it, et cetera, which uh -huh. to me was a little bit more reassuring because like you said, it's from one area uh -huh. to the next. And I also have this other hypothesis, which could be completely wrong, that there's almost when more tourists get into it, there's almost the expectation of I'm supposed to purge. I'm supposed to do these mm. type of things. And I've often wondered if they add other admixtures or tobacco or who knows whatever to it to make sure people get what they wanted to experience. But again, that's, I don't have any data to base that on. <laughs> I've definitely come across my fair share of people, like foreign people here who are drinking ayahuasca and some people will come to me and say, Hey, Vic, like I haven't had an experience. And I'll ask them, Hey, so what happened in the ceremony last night? And they're like, oh, like, had all these feelings in my body but like I and I vomited a bit like there weren't any visuals it's like okay that's interesting so you still had some sort of experience didn't you yeah and I've found maybe with ayahuasca getting more popular people have a perception of what the experience should look like so maybe okay I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna have all these visions and I'm gonna see all these colors and everything but I've met maestros here who don't have visions and that's not part of their experience with ayahuasca they work purely on a sensational basis that's just hmm. not how their body interacts with the plant. So I think there's a lot of misconception around that. If, you, if you're having massive visuals, that's great. But also that's not necessarily a standard. Like you've got maestros working who've been working for years who have very little visions. And they're working just on how they feel and how the bodies feel and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions and people go in with ideas and they want to have this type of experience. And yeah, I do also... I mean, with the European brews in that study, I would say people are probably putting in other things just to ensure people are getting their money's worth or stuff like that. But whether that's actually beneficial in healing is another question. Yeah, and it was very different. Like the first year, my wife was there also, and I think she had two glasses and her main goal was working on some digestion stuff and some other things she had going on. So she didn't really have any visions, but her digestion was noticeably better the next day and she felt a lot more in her stomach and rumbling and again it's always hard to say mm -hmm. what that's related to and when I was there the shaman kept coming back and because it was pretty far into the evening and I had three glasses already I'm still like the only person who's upright like kneeling just looking around and she's looking at me <laughs> what what's going on I said I don't know I don't feel anything she's like, really so she comes back, gives me a fourth glass. I lay down. I think maybe I should close my eyes and do some breathing work or whatever. She comes back about eh, maybe a half hour, 40 minutes later. It's hard to tell time. And she's, any visions? Anything going on? I was like, yeah, not really. She's, and she comes back with a fifth glass. And I remember asking her, I'm like, was this a good idea? She's, oh, you'll be fine. And she's, no visions? I'm like, no. And I remember drinking the fifth glass and her just staring at me going, interesting. And as I'm drinking it, <laughs> all of a sudden I was on a dock that like fell apart below me. And I was on a beach in South Padre Island, just drinking coffee with my wife, like getting ready to go kiteboarding. And mm. it was so weird that it literally happened like as fast as I was drinking the last glass, which mm -hmm. again, probably not from that glass. And then one of my intentions was, am I going in the right direction with my life? Am I doing the things that I should? And then I got stuck there for what literally felt like forever. If you watched a VHS loop of a tape, I could mm -hmm. tell I was watching myself and I could feel the experience, but I knew when it was going to end and it would just start over again. And it wow. was almost like 
oh, here's where you should go. And you should probably practice being present more often. So here's two years of <laughs> practicing being present. And so I was telling a buddy about this afterwards. And he's, oh, you were stuck in the eternal now. I'm like, the eternal now? <laughs> There's like names for this stuff? I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> but to me, it was... I would say dose and setting and everything makes a difference, but it was also fascinating how everyone has a different experience and you definitely get the impression Mm. of, I don't want to say controlling it, but at least the groups that we did it with, it seemed like what they set their intention to, like back to set and setting, it definitely Mm -hmm. seemed like they were moved in that direction. Although the responses, like I said, were dramatically different from one person to the next also yeah i've come across that as well it reminds me of when i first drank ayahuasca and i think it was a group of 10 people and i was drinking the smallest i started by drinking the smallest drops like honestly like i'm talking like drops little bits of ayahuasca and i'd have very intense experiences and the guy next to me is drinking two full cups and he's he's not really having any experience so that was quite funny to see that <laughs> and yeah and then there's another man there who's He's also not having an experience. Yeah, I suppose everyone's just a bit different that way, hey? (laughs) Yeah, and the interesting part is, so we go back the next year, different location, same ayahuasca, same person, and do the ceremony. I go up there and she's like, oh yeah, I remember you from last year. This large glass (laughs) is for you. I'm like, oh crap, okay, (laughs) whatever. And I remember lying back down and my question that year was, how do I decide what to do? Last year was, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm going in the right direction. How do I decide between projects and what stuff to do? And within the first half hour, it's, oh, maybe you should just work on projects that you love doing. It's like, oh, so mm-hmm. obvious. And then it was almost like, okay, can I get off the train now? It's like, I have the answer, but you just, you can't really disembark the train <laughs> no, at that point the either. Off, the train's <laughs> off. Once you've set, you're set. Yeah, which my question related to that is when you're going through an experience for people who are newer, any sort Mm. of, I guess, wisdom, I wouldn't say not necessarily trying to control it, but my thoughts are, at least what I told myself was just work on your breathing. So breathing Mm -hmm. is the one thing I can probably control. And then when I got Mm -hmm. stuck in the eternal now, the first year, my thought was, okay, it has to end at some point. And when the sun comes mm. up, everything will be fine. And as weird as mm-hmm. it was, as soon as the sun like came up over the side of the jungle, it was like, oh, I was like perfectly fine, which mm. was pretty bizarre to say the least. I think that's great advice as well. If you're, if yeah, if you want to just remembering that it's an experience as well. I mean, my, my tips for, I suppose, beginners going into the space is just checking in where you're at within yourself before you enter the space. It will all come up in the ceremony and just know that's part of the ceremony. And having confidence in who you're drinking with, once again, like I, I'd come back to that. It's probably, for me, is the most important part is feeling comfortable, but also confident in their abilities to hold that space and to navigate the ayahuasca realms. Coming back to your breathing is always a good idea. Something that I've been taught and each maestro is different, but this seems to be quite consistent with the maestros that I'm working with, is to sit up straight in the ceremonies. So that really helps you. Yeah, so with the maestro that I'm working with now, don't even think about lying down. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Interesting. Yeah, don't even think about it. That's out of the question. You can lie down maybe at the very end when everything, there's that little bit of silence and the ceremony hasn't quite ended, but the Mm -hmm. process is mainly done. You can lie down a little bit there. You can get away with it. (laughs) But if you try it before, there's no way he'll let you. Um, And yeah, his reasoning behind that is once you start to lie down, then you start to lose consciousness. So the whole point is to sit up straight in a meditative pose, sit up comfortably, make sure you've got like a good cushion and you've got enough blankets and you jump in nearby if you feel cold, but just to keep your focus in the ceremony. And for me, that helps me. And if I'm honest, that's probably the biggest thing I've learned from my ayahuasca is to stay really focused. So just closing your eyes, keeping your, keeping your focus on your experience, but yeah, nice and straight, nice and solid on the ground. Yeah. And that, that's that's a constant recommendation from not really a recommendation a requirement from the places <laughs> that I'm working with yeah I'd say there's no leeway with that one but like I said everyone's a bit different some people will let you lie down but now that I've been drinking with this maestro for quite a while and actually it's my preference like I find that it helps the ayahuasca work a lot better in me yeah I feel more 
I don't want to say in control, but I feel more, but I do feel more in control. I feel more capable. I feel stronger in my experience. It's not taking over me. I'm still very clear with what's happening. How would you describe the experience? Because at least for me going in, I was under the impression that, oh man, if I drink five glasses, I'm going to be so incapacitated that I'm going to be able to do nothing. And it was a mm. very odd sensation of, yep, I'm definitely seeing stuff. Yep, I'm definitely somewhere else. But I remember at one point I had to get up to use the bathroom. And a friend of mine, I asked her before the ceremony, I said, hey, you've done this a bunch of times. What's your best advice? And she said, if you need to use the bathroom, just get up and use the bathroom. And I'm like, what the hell kind of advice is that? This is like this is, I don't uh -huh. know this advice. And I remember lying there having this debate with myself for 20 minutes about, should I get up and use the bathroom? Should I not? I don't know if I can walk. I don't know if I can stand. <laughs> and it was a very weird sensation of definitely being very wobbly like i would not want to be operating any machinery or doing anything intensive but yet still having more motor control than what i would expect for mm. basically being zooted out of my mind <laughs> if that makes any sense i don't know if there's any other way to explain that or if that's a similar experience to what other people have or if there's something chemically going on related to that where it didn't feel like it impacted the motor portion nearly as much as i would have assumed I've definitely seen some people who haven't been able, like they need a bit of help to get up. Oh, definitely. Like but, yes. And that's their experience and there's nothing to judge or it's just how it affects different people. But yeah, for me as well, I think like even with the sitting up straight and like getting up to go to the bathroom, it reminds you in your body as well. It reminds you that you're still you and you're having an experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I forgot what your question was. At oh, point. I didn't know if there's something where my assumption was that if you would have explained that state of consciousness to me, my assumption would have been, mm -hmm. I would have been completely like flat line, like no motor control at all. But my motor mm -hmm. control was affected, but not to the degree that I thought, like I could slowly mm -hmm. get up, I could make my way to the bathroom, I could come back, I could lay down. Again, it wasn't the same for everybody. And there was a couple of people that they had some issues moving for sure. But most of the people, again, limited experience, they were able to get up on their own power, go to the bathroom, back down again, which I thought was an interesting thing where it seems to affect the sensory portion, at least in my case, substantially more than the motor portion. I also just thought of another recommendation perhaps for newbies in the space. Oh, yeah. Yeah, is that remember you can always take more. So if you're feeling like a little bit I don't know if you're feeling like okay I'm a bit nervous and maybe you prefer to take a little bit less at the start remember that's completely fine as well you can take a little bit less and you can always top up so you can always just see how you feel and say an hour goes past and like, oh actually I could do with a bit more you could always ask for more so that's a that's another thing which I find with some people can put them at ease a little bit is okay let's have a taste let's see how this feels an hour or so later okay yeah I could do a little bit more and that's also completely fine yeah there was also another recommendation that I thought of that I Oh yeah, and also um, keeping your water close is always a good idea mm. as well. Yeah, so in the cer in my last ceremony, I went through about three liters of water. It was wow. crazy. I, yeah, yeah, it really helps. It really helps the ayahuasca work. Ayahuasca loves water. And if you're feeling nauseous, drink some water. It will help. Anything in the ceremony, just keep the water nearby. Yeah, that's something that really helps me. I always make sure I've got a nice full bottle next to me in every ceremony. Interesting. Last mm. two questions as we wrap up. Do you think the DMT in ayahuasca is different or has different effects because of all the different plants, the different sourcing, etc., compared to, I'm sure you've seen some of Rick Strassman's work where they just did IV DMT. Mm. Do you think there's a difference between the two? And if so, what would that difference be? Yeah, this is also an area that I think needs more research, but these are my current thinkings on it. Is so this line of thought was inspired by perhaps a few years ago when I was working in the jungle with the nice store. And I was asking about some plants and we're just having our usual conversation about the jungle. And he tells me, he's okay, you know what? Ayahuasca is interesting because it's with the chakruna that you can see. So you can see the spirit of the plant. So let's go back to what we were talking about earlier. Chakruna is the plant that contains the DMT. So I almost wonder if there's something about 
the way the DMT interacts, maybe it interacts with the DMT and every other plant, because we've got to remember all the living plants do have some amount of DMT in them, whether it's higher or lower concentrations. So I do wonder if it's a shikuna or perhaps something in the DMT brew that allows you to see the different parts of the plant and maybe the essences or be able to feel them a bit better. I would say my understanding of like pure DMT and crystal form or in chunga form which is where it's extracted into a leaf it's very different from the ayahuasca experience it's super super different. it's yeah it's largely different i would say ayahuasca is a lot more healing in a therapeutic sense i would be more likely to depending on what someone needed actually i would always be more likely to recommend something like ayahuasca over this because this seems to be i don't know DMT blasts you off into another dimension and you come back and yeah, you have some good feelings, but ayahuasca seems to be a little bit more grounded, like it seems to be doing the healing, like the work as well. That's not saying you don't have to do it yourself after the ceremony, but it seems to be a little more grounding in that experience. Interesting. And I would assume you think there's a difference between the standard blends of ayahuasca used versus... I guess what they call pharmawasca, which is just a straight chemical DMT and an MAOI inhibitor. I've participated in enough cooking ceremonies to know how much thought and care goes into the brew itself, to know that it is incredibly different. More recently, actually, we had, so with the ayahuasca that we've been drinking here, we made this back in November and we cooked so much ayahuasca. Oh my gosh, we had liters. It was a big <laughs> ayahuasca cooking week. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because there was a vine growing and it had been, it was 15 years old. It was ready to be cooked. And we're like, okay, we're going to cook all of the vines. So seven days later, we've got, God knows, I think maybe eight liters we managed to cook. Wow. And I'm not talking, like when you were talking about your ceremonies, you mentioned it's a daime brew. So from what I understand with the daime brew, it's usually a lot more diluted, which makes sense if you were drinking four or five cups. But with the doses, with the ayahuasca, maybe 30 milliliters is a decent dose. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's very unlikely that someone might ask for more, but it's, you'll, in the ceremonies I've been with people, I usually have. Yeah, <laughs> like, you don't really get many people wanting more after that. So yeah, we cooked that ayahuasca and it was good and we drank it. The visions weren't very strong and the maestro said to me, hey, Becky, you know what, let's cook again. Let's make some more ayahuasca. So about a month ago, we did another three days of cooking. And this time we only got about, I'd say, three liters out of the brew, 2.5 maybe. And with this, we put in the other plants. We put Kauwe, we put in one Visa Bihau, the plant I was talking about before, all the plants for visions. And we mixed the two brews together. And it was super interesting because I, and at this point, I've participated in, I'd say, around 120, 130-ish ceremonies. Wow. So I've done my fair share of ayahuasca. Not a great amount like the maestros. I've participated in my fair amount. And it was interesting for me because I could distinctly see the difference between the two brews. Oh, hmm. sorry, the chickens are going up in the background. But anyway, right. I could see the difference in the two brews. Like, I, I could see the other plants in this brew, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, more visions are coming in. This is coming from this plant, but it's not super intense because we'll mix it with the other brew. Yeah, so that was a very interesting experience to have. It's almost like beer making or making alcohol or wine or anything that has a very it. complex chemical breakdown, even coffee, depending on who you talk to. You just look yeah. at all the different... Yeah, wine is grapes, but where are the grapes grown? What is the condition? And you could argue wine is more simple because there's really only a couple main ingredients in it where ayahuasca has vines from different areas, different amounts. I'm sure the growing season affects it, the brewing method. Like yeah. you said, you start combining it with other things and you start combining ayahuasca brews together. And I think that, I think when you said the beer, I think beer is a great example for this. Cause if you look into artisanal beer, that's a fantastic example. And people who are very experienced with drinking beer, they can taste the subtle differences and yeah. you get a little, a different hop. Okay. This is that. I'm not experienced. I'm not super experienced with beer. I have no real idea about how it's made, but I imagine it's, it's quite a specific procedure. In that study I was referring to earlier, the one with the different chemical composition analysis, they also did an analysis of the different compounds that in the vine in different regions of Brazil, so urban and rural areas. And yeah, they found a difference in the concentrations of the chemical compounds as well, which is quite interesting. So you've got a lot of variation into what creates the brew, which then creates the experience. And then you've got the effect of the maestro and the other participants and the physical location. So it's a very complex picture that comes together to facilitate someone's experience. And last question, do you think because of all the 
complexities. I know MAPS and other organizations are looking to get, at least in the U.S., legalization approval, possibly for MDMA, for PTSD, mm -hmm. potentially psilocybin for depression. Do you think ayahuasca would be much farther down on that list? Because the scientific process in general tends to be very reductionistic, and it might be harder to mm -hmm. replicate it and to actually pinpoint as to the even just a simple mechanism of action across it? This is a great question. And yeah, thanks for I suppose, bringing this question into this conversation. This is what I would like to see with ayahuasca. So ayahuasca, as we've talked about quite extensively right now, is a ceremony. It's a cultural practice, right? What I would like to see with ayahuasca is still the cultural exchange. So somehow to keep this relationship with the indigenous folk, whether that's people coming to the Amazon and actually spending time with them, but if that's maybe not in your means, whether it's them going to different places and holding ceremonies, but keeping that cultural connection. I personally, another part of my project as well is looking into ontology, so different ways of perceiving the world. And mm. in Amazonia, a very common ontology that you might find is that plants have spirits or that, and plants have spirits and they're able to act like with intention and they're able to, they're not just static objects in our day-to-day -day life. And I think by being here, and this is from my personal experiences in the Amazon is, yes, the ayahuasca is healing in itself, but also learning from the culture, from their way of living, like having these conversations, spending time actually exchanging is also a nice way to give back because you're exchanging, you're exchanging your knowledge and receiving their knowledge. And there's, there's a feedback loop happening, but there's something important about understanding their way of seeing the world, I think. So the brew is something in itself and the experience, the ayahuasca experience is something in itself, but actually being in the jungle, being close to nature getting an insight into how this world looks, I think is something very nice to take home. And also you've got to remember this is a sensitive practice, right? Like the indigenous folk of the Amazon, they've had their fair share of trouble to say the least, like you've got the rubber boom, you've had the decimation of so many tribes here. So I think now with ayahuasca, it's almost a chance to make sure that these people have, have their practices preserved. There's respect for these practices. There's an initiative to keep these practices going. For a while, there were people who weren't learning. There were young people who weren't interested. Even now, there's a lot of, there's like a gap in the knowledge where there's the old people who know, but people who are younger are going to university to study or leave the cities, leave to go to big cities, which I completely understand. But I wonder if there's more of a, more of a need for ayahuasca or more of an interest for ayahuasca, if that might encourage a trans, a, like a cultural transmission of this knowledge, just to make sure these like practices are preserved going forward so that's what i'd like to see i'd like to see something like that happen is to make sure that the people here are still somehow involved in the process and their space is not lost and their space isn't taken up by something else because at the end of the day for me the maestros and the people leading the ceremonies are incredibly important and their knowledge on how to safely navigate the space which is also a big deal with psychedelics right now is how can we safely navigate the space you've got to remember these people have years and then you've got generations of knowledge behind them so they're not newbies to the psychedelic game and that's the, those are the people i place my confidence in for navigating these very sensitive psychedelic states yeah that's one of my biggest fear i think psychedelics potentially becoming legal is definitely a huge movement in the correct direction but i also get fearful of just the potential overconfidence of, ah, oh, we'll figure this stuff out. Yeah, you may want to talk to people who have been doing it for hundreds to thousands of years. Like they probably have a lot to teach yeah. you about it, but it's just this almost egotistical thing of, ah, oh, we'll figure it out. And it, I don't know that it just takes one bad experience somewhere to have knee jerk reaction to go the opposite direction. And then, oh, they're all bad. And look at this thing that was horrible that happened. And you're probably not mentioning the set and setting, what the people did, where yeah. they got it from. And to me, it's oh, even, yeah, it's just like <laughs> a scalpel. Yeah. yeah. It's you're, we went in on SSRIs, which is never going to be a good thing. So yeah. It, yeah, I think of it just like a scalpel. Like you, if you're an experienced surgeon, you can probably do a lot of things, save people's lives. You can do a lot of good stuff. If you're not, and you don't have any training, it's not going to end well. It's going to be a, really horrible thing and the bigger the effect size something have has the more mm. potential i think it has to be helpful and then also your risk is generally going to go up at the same time so you're left with how are they handled what is the experience of the practitioners the set and setting etc so i think there's a lot we can still 
learn about that and hopefully we don't screw it up. <laughs> I, yeah, I really like what you said about the surgeon though, because that's how I feel with every experienced practitioner. I'm like, okay, I'm going to an experienced surgeon. And that's the difference between going to someone who's in first year med school and someone who's an experienced surgeon. And if I'm doing very sensitive things with my psyche, I'm not going to go to the person who's just started in first year med school. I'm going to go to the person who's incredibly experienced at what they do. It's a sensitive process. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your time. And thank you so much for all your research you've done and your continuing research, which is awesome that you're out there doing that. Because I think the more research we have in this of all types, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, all of that, I think is just definitely going to be beneficial. And if people want to find out more about you i know you're on twitter and you've got some other places a blog where can they read more um, about you yeah so my online identity these days is beck plant so b-e-k plants p-l-a-n-t-s so twitter handle is at beck plants instagram at beck plants and my blog is wordpress.com hash beck plants thanks for having me mike that was so fun to talk to you and yeah thank you <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it and have a wonderful day there in Peru. Thank you, and you too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast today. Really appreciate it. Huge thanks to Rebecca for all of her time and calling in from literally the jungles of Peru. Highly recommend you check out her information. Our best place is Twitter. Go to Twitter at B-E-K Plants. That's at B-E-K-P-L-A-N-T-S. And you'll find a link to all of her wonderful writing and her work there. So huge thanks to her for coming on the podcast and discussing all of the pros and the cons. I think that more topics like this need to be discussed because at least in the U.S., it looks like these compounds or the psychedelics in general for specific reasons will be approved maybe as early as the end of this year, but most likely 2020. This may include MDMA for PTSD, although MDMA is not technically considered a classic psychedelic. After that, potentially psilocybin for treatment of depression. And once some of these drugs become approved, they may be able to be used under the guide of a physician in an off-label manner. So I think having discussions like this about the pros and the cons of what is coming is going to be super beneficial. And again, that was the main reason for doing this podcast. And I also just find the compounds in and of themselves to be extremely interesting for various reasons. One of them is they appear to increase neuroplasticity, possibly through BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor and other things, which I think opens them up for lots of potential future clinical uses. The downside is that's pretty new in the resurgence of research again. So there's a lot of stuff that we still don't know as we talked about in the podcast. So if you're interested in more advanced recovery and how to be anti-fragile and just generally much harder to kill, check out the Physiologic Flexibility Certification it will be opening up again on March 20th, 2023. Go to physiologicflexibility.com. There'll be a link below here in your favorite podcast player for all of the information. It'll be open for exactly one week. And as of now, it won't open again until possibly later this year. So if you're interested in it, please check it out. You can get on to the wait list there. Thanks again to Rebecca. Check out her stuff. Greatly appreciate it. If you want more of a kind of research-based talk, I'll be doing a talk on psychedelics at the International Society of Sports Nutrition in Florida, mid-June of this year, 2023. And I also have a link to a previous podcast I did about my experience with some of these compounds in Costa Rica. As I mentioned, currently in the U.S., these compounds are federally illegal, and they are currently not approved for any use. That may change in the future, but as of now, that is a current state, and none of this is advice for medical use. Talk to your physician and proceed accordingly. 
We just wanted to have a discussion about the research and what it potentially shows for the pros and the cons. As always, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. <clears throat> really appreciate it. Uh, we've got a lot more great stuff coming up, so stay tuned. We'll talk to you all very soon. Thank you so much. Well, that was different. Yep, lousy, but, but different. different.